is this attractive figure. Oops, my laser's not working. Okay, this guy in the middle. Um, as you heard from the group, you got an o kind of an overview of his life, his contributions, the things that, that he has done. Actually, give me one second. I might have to pause this and reset this. If the All right, so I'm relegated to not use to sticking by the keyboard here. We'll be talking about this work, his essay concerning human understanding. Um, what we will be talking about today roughly covers materials from the first two of those four books. Um, and then next week we're going to say a little more about materials in the second book, and I'm going to actually give you a little extra reading that goes into the fourth book. So, in book one, chapter one, um, in sections one and two, Locke tells us what he's up to in this essay. That the goal of it is to inquire into the origin, the certainty, and the extent of human knowledge. Um, and he lays out, this is roughly the structure of what he's trying to do in the whole book. First, he wants to talk about where do we get our ideas from? Where, what is, where do they originate? Secondly, um, he wants to understand the knowledge that the understanding has by those ideas. And third, that the nature of beliefs uh, that one can infer from these ideas. So where do we get ideas? The knowledge that we acquire through those ideas, and then anything that we can infer from that knowledge. This should be, this should almost sound a little bit, not exactly, but a little bit like what Descartes was doing, where it's like, hey, where do we get the basic foundational starting point? From those starting points, what can we know? And then from that, what can we know from there? Uh, a, a similar kind of foundationalist structure. If you have your books, let's open them up to page 317. Um, I actually just realized that I left my book in the office, so I'm going to ask if I can get a volunteer to read, and I will point out uh, where you can start reading. Any volunteers? All right, so let's look at 317. Um, Let's start in the, almost in the middle of that bottom paragraph where he says, we should. Yeah, and just read that to the very end, please. We should not then perhaps be so eager out of, a, out of an affect, affectation of a universal knowledge to raise questions and perplex ourselves and others with disputes about things to which our understandings are not suited and of which we cannot frame in our minds any clear or distinct perceptions or about which, as it has perhaps too often happened, we do not have any notions at all. We can find out how far the understanding can extend its view, how far it has faculties to attain certainty, and in what cases they can only judge and guess, can they learn to content themselves with what is attainable by us in the state. Very good. So that's one thing to keep in mind. <coughs> what? Another volunteer wants to read? All right, let me show you. This is look on the middle right on 317. Um, so that... Um, Let's start here in the, almost in the middle of the page where he says, men may find matter sufficient. And I might interrupt you to stop it. Just keep reading. Okay. Men may find matter sufficient to busy their heads and employ their hands with uh, variety, delight, and satisfaction if they will not boldly quarrel with their own constitution and throw away the blessing their hands are filled with because they are not big enough to grasp everything. We shall not have much reason to complain of the narrowness of our minds if we will only employ them about what may be of use to us, for of that they are very capable. And it will be an unpardonable as well as childish peevishness 
if we undervalue the advantages of our knowledge and neglect to improve it to the ends for which it is given to us, because there are some things that are set out of the reach of it. It will be no excuse to an idle and untoward servant who would not attend his business by candlelight to plead that he does not have broad sunshine. The candle that is set up in us shines bright enough for all our purposes. The discoveries we can make with this ought to satisfy us, and we shall then use our understandings right when we entertain all objects in that way in proportion that they are suited to our faculties, and upon those grounds they are capable of being proposed to us, and not per require demonstration and demand certainty where probability only is to be had and which is sufficient to govern, govern all our concerns. And that's good. Okay. And there's probably only like a couple sentences left, but yeah. that's, that's really good. And one other thing, you can see the upcoming questions here that you should be thinking about. How does Locke's assessment of the extent of human knowledge differ from Descartes and Leibniz? And what do you think this tells us? what to expect from Locke's account of human knowledge. But let's get this one last thing. Let's turn the page to 318. Can I get another volunteer to do that? Thank you, Amanda. And I think I want you to read all of section six. So okay. All of section six. Knowing the extent, extent of our cap capacities will hinder us for useless cur curiosity, skepticism, and idleness. We know that our own strength, we shall not know better what to undertake with hopes of its success. And we have well surveyed the powers of our own minds and make some estimate of what we may expect for them. We shall not incline either to sit still and not to set our thoughts on work at all in despair of knowing anything nor on the other side questioning everything and disclaim all knowledge. Because some things are not to be understood, it is great use of the sailor to know the length of his line, though he cannot fathom all depths of the, the ocean with it. It is well he knows that he is long enough to reach the bottom at such places that are necessary to direct his voyage and caution him against running upon shoals that may ruin him. Our business here is not to know all things but those which concern our conduct, if we can find out those measures by which rational creature put it in that state in which man is in this world, may ought to govern his opinions and actions depending theorem, we need not to be troubled that some other things escape our knowledge. Very good. Now think especially, that's a beautiful passage here about the but the sailor and the line, knowing the depth of his line, the previous passage about the candle and the light. What is Locke generally saying here about uh, human knowledge, about what, what he's up to? And how does this contrast even maybe a little bit, if you could see the connections uh, with what especially Descartes was doing? Yeah, well, I would like to say that he's suggesting that human knowledge is only a, only so much can be attained by one person um, versus when Descartes and Leibniz they just discussed all knowledge and how that is attainable. Um, I feel like Locke's only focusing on the amount of knowledge one person can attain based on their, maybe, uh, I want to say career, I'm not using the right word, but based on the things that surround them and mm -hmm. only know so much about that. Like, yeah, that's like, good. And what we said so far. So. Yeah, that's really good. Go. So. Um, just to add on to that thing that he's saying that that's all right for our purposes of understanding human knowledge. Like we don't know have to know how, we don't have to worry about knowing everything ever. We just we we already possess the uh, faculties we need to understand what we need to know. Yeah, maybe the key thing here is about this like need to know. You've got what you need for your purposes. Um, Good. Other thoughts on how to make sense of some of these passages or observations you have from these things that they're saying about the nature of our understanding? Yeah, I think he's a little more down to earth than the other two. The other two are kind of talking like 
sort of crazy. And he's just kind of like. And what was crazy, perhaps, about like what Descartes was up to? Um, <coughs> some of it was just kind of far fetched, I guess. And one reason for that might be because Descartes said in order to n to really know something, it has to be certain. You have to have that absolute inst absolute certainty. It has to be no room for doubt. Locke is saying something a little different here. He's saying, well, human reason has limits, and we might not be able to know everything, and perhaps he's going to say, well, you don't have to be absolutely certain, you just have to know it so well for our purposes. And to set the standard for knowledge so high is essentially to make it unattainable. So maybe what Locke is saying here is that we should not make the standard for knowledge so high that human beings can't attain it. Um, rather, we just need to set it high enough to where it meets our purposes, to where it's useful for what we need to accomplish. Um, and also, there's a recognition that we don't need to know everything. Descartes was going to try to prove that there was a God, that we have an immortal soul, that we, um, you know, all of these kinds of big things that we'll have this perfect foundation for the sciences. Locke is saying, well, maybe there are just going to be things out of our reach. Maybe we won't be able to prove all of that, but let's just prove the stuff we need to have for our purposes. The fisherman, or the sailor, doesn't need to have a line that goes all the way down to measure the depths of the ocean. Why, anybody know why a sailor would need some kind of line to tell how deep the water is? Yeah. So when he's sailing, he doesn't like run up on land in the middle of the ocean or like going through a bay or something. Right. So all you need is a line that's long enough to make sure that it would give you enough warning and enough understanding the depth so you're not going to run your ship aground. You don't need a line that's going to tell you how deep the ocean is at any depth. You just need it for your to it would tell you this much. Maybe what he's saying is that God has equipped us with enough understanding not to know everything, but just to know the stuff we need to know. So I think this is a very different kind of perspective on human knowledge. We'll see how this plays out. Um, take a look on 318 in the middle of that page. We don't necessarily have to read this out loud. Just take a look at section 8, chapter 1 there. Um, somebody tell me, what does Locke mean by the term idea? Like the most common word he uses throughout the whole essay, this is where he defines it, so we have to be clear. find it, even if you don't know what it means. <laughs> yeah. The object of the understanding when a man thinks. The object of the understanding when a man thinks. So, here's one way to think about this. It's whatever it is that you can think about. Whatever is an object of thought. So this could have, one of the most obvious things this could apply to it would be a belief. But it could also apply to your, to just an experience or a sensation. It could apply to a feeling that you have when you think about it. Pretty much anything that you can entertain as a thought is an idea. Questions about that? So, what we're going to move on to now is chapter 2. So chapter 1 is just kind of the setup for the book, letting us know that he, what he's aiming to do, and letting us know that he, he thinks that the scope of human knowledge is not unbounded, but has limits. In the second chapter, what we're going to be trying to do is show that there are no innate ideas. 
Um, in Locke's day, the existence of innate ideas was widely accepted, due largely to the influence of Descartes and the Cambridge Platonists. These guys uh, that I may have mentioned in passing and setting up some of the background of some of the other readings we've done. So an innate idea is supposed to be an idea that you're born knowing. You don't acquire it through experience. It's just something that has always been in your mind since birth. Some traditional examples of innate ideas would be something like this, that no part is greater than the whole. Whatever is, is. Nothing can both be and not be at the same time in the same way. That the sum of the interior angles of a triangle are equal to two right angles. These are ideas that many of these people, Descartes and, the, and these Cambridge Platonists, they thought you were born with the, these ideas stocked up in your mind, these ideas and more. Locke is going to argue that you can't believe this, that this doesn't really bear out. So, in section two of this part, Locke summarizes one of the more popular arguments of his day for innate ideas. Now, this is not Descartes' argument for innate ideas. Um, if you remember, the best argument maybe we got from Descartes on this was that wax argument from the second meditation. This argument is maybe better related to some of these other figures, Lord Herbert, Bishop Stillingfleet, and some of the Cambridge Platonists. And the argument that they put forward goes roughly like this. There are ideas that are universally agreed upon by all mankind. Well, if there are ideas that are generally agreed upon or universally agreed upon by all mankind, then innate ideas exist, and therefore innate ideas exist. The way to think about this argument is to kind of think, look, everybody seems to have a certain set of ideas in common. Like, everybody holds the belief that something cannot both be and not be at the same time. Like, well, that's the law of non-contradiction. It can't both be the case that something is and is not. So, what would explain how all of these people all have these same ideas? Well, it might be because these ideas are innate. So since there are these ideas that everybody agrees upon, and it would you almost want to say that if that were the case, then it would have to follow that innate ideas exist. Therefore, innate ideas exist. That's the idea here. That's the argument. Before we get into Locke's criticism, does it make you, you don't have to agree with this argument, but do you kind of get the motivation for the argument? Do you see why somebody would think, well, if everybody agrees to a certain set of ideas, one way to explain that would be through uh, thinking that these ideas are all innate, that we're all born with them. Yeah? Isn't it kind of just like a definition they're setting up, like saying innate ideas exist, therefore innate ideas exist? <laughs> Only if you think innate means universally agreed upon. Because they don't, what they, they almost want to look at is the phenomena is more like, hey, we can, it is, like we can look at all of humanity and tell everybody does agree to these things. You can't find people who, who reject these claims. So it must be the case, so then the next thing is, what explains the fact that it's all agreed upon? Well, because these ideas must have been in place since birth. Yeah? Like, how does anybody know that everybody agrees with it? Well, this is maybe going to take us then into Locke, because Locke, one of the things he wants to say, well, he wants to say that both of these premises are unfounded. And so, let's go ahead and look at these, then. Locke is going to argue that both premises of that argument are false. So the first premise, um, he says, is false, because, then this maybe is actually related more to what you might, what, what would relate to where this conversation was about to go with, with Alex, which is, if the idea, just because the ideas are universally agreed upon, it doesn't follow that they have to be innate. There might be, in other words, there could just be another way in which everybody gets these same ideas. What if we all just have the same set of common, for Locke, common experiences? And these common experiences are the basis by which we form innate ideas. Or, Uni these ideas that are universally accepted. So it's a larger set. That's what we're talking about. Yeah. So we'll talk 
when we move, we're actually going to talk about maybe how this works in a moment. But maybe the bigger thing that I see him putting more stock in is the second premise being false, which I think speaks maybe more to, to what Bridget was saying, which is that he says that these ideas are not known to young children and what he calls idiots. Now, what he says, what he claims are idiots here are people that are mentally challenged. And I don't think that at this time, the word idiot was probably actually a proper technical term for referring to these people. Um, and then over time has become a pejorative word. So I don't think he's throwing, I don't think he's calling people names. Um, I think he's just being very, he, he, he's using what would be the proper clinical term of his time. Um, to think about this, I, the second critique here, this is what you have to think if you believe in innate ideas. You have to think that when little infants and babies are, are born, in their mind is the very thought of these innate ideas. These innate ideas are in their minds from birth. So, the little baby is <laughs> sitting there in the crib going goo goo ga ga, but in the mind, what is the child thinking? Nothing can both be and not be at the same time. The interior, the sum of the interior angles of a triangle equal to right triangle. I've got right now a child that's almost three years old and one that is like nine months old. I, I love my children, I think they're pretty smart for their age. Um, do I think that my nine-month-old has these ideas in her mind? No. If you believe, though, like Descartes, that we have innate ideas, you would have to think that even at birth, depending on your view of persons, maybe at conception, that person has these ideas floating around in their mind. They have these thoughts. But it doesn't seem like, it seems a pretty, seems pretty far-fetched to say the baby is thinking these very mature thoughts. So that's essentially what Locke is saying is wrong with the second premise, that you have to attribute to babies, infants, and then people who are, um, you know, mentally challenged that they have these kinds of mature thoughts that we don't really see any evidence for. Um, now, the rest of what we get from Book 1, Chapter 2 is essentially him answering objections to this uh, line of reasoning. So one thing somebody might say is, look, the ideas are innate in these children. They're just not known to the children. So that my nine-month-old really does have the ideas, but my nine-year-old just doesn't know what they are. And then as they grow up, they're able to sort of get in contact with those ideas that are implanted in their mind from birth. Well, Locke says that this idea is just completely contradictory. And, uh, so the way Locke puts that is that an unknown idea is a contradiction. To have an idea is to know it. So you can't, to say that you've got ideas but you don't know what they are is a contradiction. What else could you mean that you have ideas that you don't know what they are? If you've got the idea, you've got to know what it is. So that's not going to work. Another objection that he considers in this section is that the capacity for the ideas is innate. So this is actually closer to what would be Leibniz's view, um, that the ideas themselves are not in the mind from birth. It's that... Um, you are born with the capacity for these ideas. And as you grow up and mature, uh, you're able to sort of unlock those capacities. What Locke wants to say in response to this is that that's just too broad. That would be too liberal of a definition of innate. Uh, because if, all you, if what you say is all you need is for the capacity in order for the idea to be innate, well, then all of our ideas would be innate because we're born with the capacity for every idea that we have. You're born with the capacity to know that, you know, I'm wearing, I guess you could call this green, a green tie. Um, was that innate knowledge? No. I mean, nobody would say that's innate. You are born with the capacity.
to know that you, uh, you know, that you would take a philosophy class on Wednesday night in the spring semester of 2014. Was that idea innate? No, nobody would say that's innate knowledge. So the fact that you have the capacity for that knowledge doesn't mean that the ideas that are obtained through it would be innate. So unless you're willing to say all of our ideas are innate, which nobody is willing to say, then it follows that you can't just say the capacity for the ideas innate makes the ideas themselves innate. So another kind of objection, I spread this out over sections, this is, I think, the moral of sections 6 to 16 here. So here I'm covering a lot of ground. Um, if you want to go over anything specifically in these sections, let me know. Um, what I think essentially the objection is, is that the ideas arise from the use of reason as opposed to experience. So since we acquire these ideas through reasoning and not through experience, it must follow that the ideas were innate, whereas everything else we acquire through experience. The bottom line for Locke here is to say something like this. Reason deduces truths from what is already known. Your reason doesn't generate new content. Your reason doesn't supply any new information that wasn't already there. So it's sort of like saying your mind gives you the idea of, you know, A, and your mind gives you the idea that if A, then Sorry, experience gives you the idea of A. Experience then gives you the idea that if A, then B. Therefore, your mind deduces from that, well, B is the case. Well, that's not any new information. All that information was already sort of contained in the experience. Your mind just deduced truth from what was already known. You don't get anything really brand new out of reason. And for that reason, um, you can't claim to get... Uh, you can't claim that reason is sort of an original source of new content. Um, we're going we're gonna to see how this plays out actually later in the course, um, which is that Locke is going to say there's another way in which we can get these ideas. We don't have to get these ideas just... Um, I should put it this way. There's a way to, there's a story to be told how we get these ideas through experience. And I'm going to, I know I have up here that we should read this section. I want to hold off on this because we're going to talk more about how this works later. Uh, any questions about how these, this line of reasoning goes? For any of you that have had me for intro, I think that you might recognize parts of this section, at least from our intro class. Yeah. Just a question. Um, is is there like a difference in the way they're thinking of idea? Because like for example, the first one, I'm th sort of thinking that the people that believe in the ideas, they think them almost like parameters that you have when you're born. And he's thinking of them as something sort of different. Mm -hmm. So is could, could there possibly be a, a difference in the definitions they're using for idea? That could be the case. The question would even be if you give like a more clear definition or you just get really clear about what do you mean, what are these maybe people who believe in innate ideas, what do they really mean? I'm not sure that you're still going to come out of that, get come out of this unscathed. Um, and I think that that is part of the issue. So most of the people who might be inclined to innate ideas would either go with something that would be like these first two things as why. So, like, you might come up with some kind of Freudian idea of psychology, where there are parts of the self, there are parts of our mind that are obscure to us, that are unknown to us, that are hidden. Maybe you could say there's something like that going on, and so that's where the innate ideas are. They're in that part of the self that's unknown. Locke, I think, would just reply the exact same way to that. What do you mean by a self you don't know about? How could there be something that is you and you not know what it is? Um, and and I think that more sophisticated uh, objections to like Freudian psychology almost go along these same kinds of line, the same line of reasoning. Other questions about this? I 
I think that when you really look closely at what Locke is doing, this is ultimately really suggesting a direct argument against innate ideas. So here's a variation on that argument from universal consent. I've changed the claims considerably, though. So here's the way to think about this. The first claim would be to say, look, if innate ideas exist, then wouldn't it follow that there would be ideas that are universally agreed upon by all people? That seems to be right. Because if there are, if innate ideas really did exist, everybody should have those ideas. Or you shouldn't think that some people got them and some people don't. But, based on what we just looked at, Locke says, well, but there are no ideas that are universally agreed upon to all mankind. And since that would follow if innate ideas exist, Guess what? It's not the case that innate, innate ideas exist. Given what he's ju we've just gone over and very quickly in these past few slides, it seems like if you, if you, you want to go along with Locke on those claims, you shouldn't just say there's no good reason to believe in innate ideas. You should actually come to this conclusion. There's positively good reason to think that innate ideas do not exist. And what do y'all think? What do y'all think about that? Is there anybody that, that's holding out for innate ideas that would like to make a run at Locke here? I'll be nice. Yeah. Um, I don't. I agree with him in that, but then there's like, what if you were to say like, like everyone agrees upon that there's a sun, <laughs> like we're on Earth or something. So this would be kind of interesting, which would then be because. Do you think that those should count as innate ideas? That the sun exists? That we're on planet Earth? I think so. I mean, to me, it's an idea, I guess. Locke would agree that probably all conscious, sentient, ration, rational beings hold these beliefs. But the question is, where do you get those beliefs from? Did you get them because you were born with them, or did you get them because you learned them through experience? Locke would say those are better explained by saying we get it through experience and learning. Not that it's just something that we, that we are just born knowing. Yeah? I'm just curious how Locke would respond to you would consider like uh, basic human needs as an idea, you know what I mean, like uh, instinct type deals. Yeah. So one kind of example. You can think about hunger, so it's clearly an idea. You're born being hungry, so that, I mean, you know what I mean? Like, it, mm -hmm. it's, like it's bordering something. A, maybe a, a slightly better example might be like when a newborn is born, you don't have to teach a newborn how to nurse. A newborn baby just knows how to do it. Um, would that be an example of an innate idea? Something that is not learned through experience, but they're just born knowing. It looks like it. Um, I think this is how Locke would respond. He would say... Ol that would only be an example of an innate idea if the child conducted that behavior through like thought and reasoning as opposed to just like reflex. Um, reflex responses are not thoughtful, they're not conscious, they're not intentional. They don't involve the use of the mind. So I didn't know this, um, but as a kid, I would go like to the doctor's office and they'd check your reflexes, you know, you're supposed to just kind of hang a limb and they take a little hammer and hit your reflexes. I thought the whole thing was just to tell if I could feel the hammer. So anytime the doctor hit it, I just kick. Um, lucky me, I guess my reflexes were just fine. But um, when the doctor hits your reflex joint on your knee and you kick, it's not because of some idea in your mind that you do it. It's just a response. Locke would likely say, unless you can prove otherwise, Young children, like newborns who do these kinds of things, it's just reflex responses. No thought needed. Any other defenses of innate ideas anyone wants to try?
Um, or any other questions at this point? So at this point, we covered actually a lot of the reading. Um, if there's any passage in there you would like me to clarify or engage with that you thought was difficult or that you were curious about, or if there was just some observation you had, here's your. This is your time. Yeah. So as a, as in my head, um, you said about reflexes um, that they aren't ideas. So what if the I don't I guess I don't have a word for it. What if the notion that something can be and not can't be and not be? Yeah. That's more of a reflex of your mind rather than an idea. Well, in that case, this is different because when we use like the law of non-contradiction, we use it in thought. It's not just like if somebody says hey, I would like you to both, you know, exist and not exist, that you just as a reflex response say, illogical. <laughs> you think about it, hopefully not for too long, and you say, hey, that's impossible because that violates the law of non-contradiction. And so that wouldn't just be a reflex response, that would be actually you using the content of thought to arrive at some idea. Arguably, when a computer engages in what you might so this might be as controversial. I'll say, let's call it reasoning in quotes. When a computer engages in reasoning, it doesn't, arguably, it is doing a reflex response. It is not actually engaging in conscious thought and entertaining the content of the beliefs and then giving you some rational um, conclusion that was the result of the thought process. It is just reflex responses. Mm -hmm. I'm just wondering what he would say, like, like, like Will said with the word instinct, what would he say that is? Like, cause like I know it's not human, but say like mm -hmm. a salmon is born in the river and it swims downstream into a lake. Right. It knows that it can't swim back up until three to five years later, and then it swims back up to like within the ideal spot that it was born originally. So is, would he consider that or like a reflex? He would have to say one of two things: either that it's a reflex, or that it you, or that the fish can actually learn that through some kind of like it gets the ideas through experience. If ultimately <coughs> these kinds of cases get too hard to explain, then maybe he's, there's a problem with his philosophy. Although what he might ultimately say is, well, what makes you think animals can think at all? I mean, we love the, we love the furry creatures, but maybe they're not. Maybe you're attributing too much consciousness and thought to them. He'd, want, he'd probably want to stick to human things. Let's go ahead and take our first break here, and let's come back when our clock says, let's say, 6.32. Give me a chance to re reboot here.